And turn with me this morning to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, in just a minute I'll be reading from verses 1 through 9. Before I do that, let me just first very carefully set this up in light of everything that we've covered in the previous chapter relative to the distinction that is to be made between Abraham's physical descendants, later identified as Israelites and later still as Jews, and Abraham's spiritual descendants, those who, whether Jew or Gentile, are children according to the promise, the redeemed of God. As for the Jew who is merely a Jew outwardly, that is, one who has undergone physical circumcision and not the circumcision of the heart, Paul insists that such a one is not a Jew at all. In verse 29, Paul is very clear when he says, he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Over in chapter 4, Paul goes into considerable detail, making the argument that Abraham was justified before God, not as a result of the circumcision that he underwent, but while uncircumcised, having his God-given faith credited to him as righteousness. And remember this very thing, because it's really important that we're uh, going to take this into consideration in what we have to cover in our time together this morning. Abraham was neither an Israelite nor a Jew. This is a big misunderstanding among Jews and others uh, who have not stopped to consider the fact that Abraham predates the Jewish people. Abraham predates the Israelites. Abraham was the grandfather of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and through whose people God would begin to work, unfolding his plan of redemption in a wholesale way. Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was not an Israelite. Those were two terms that were unknown to him. They would have been very foreign to him during his lifetime. Over in Romans 9, Paul makes this point again. In fact, you may want to turn there and just keep your finger there because we're going to be going back to Romans 9 in just a minute. But in Romans 9, verses 6 through 8, Paul's once again very clear when he says they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel or Jacob, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be named, that is... It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. And who are these children of the promise that Paul speaks of here? The children of the promise are those who by God's grace are numbered among Abraham's spiritual children. Those, as God promised Abraham, who would number as the stars in the heavens, the sand on the seashore, and would share the same faith that God had so graciously given Abraham himself. One thing that seems to be forgotten among the Jews, as well as many in the dispensational camp who erroneously view Jews and Gentiles as being redeemed in two fundamentally different ways, one of the things that they fail to understand is that even as early as Genesis 12 and verse 3, where God makes this promise to Abraham, God promises to bless all the families of the earth. Now understand, this is a, a particular usage of the word all that, like other usages in other places, doesn't mean all without exception. It means all without distinction. In other words, God has promised to bless, through Abraham, all kinds of people. Not just Jews. Not just Gentiles. All kinds of people. Simply another way of saying that it was always God's intention to save, not just from among the Jews, but from among the Gentiles as well. Now, here's where things get a little confusing for some. Uh, no doubt this includes some of you here this morning. 
If there's no salvific value, if there is no redemptive benefit or advantage in being numbered among the Jews on a purely physical level, and there isn't, clearly that's the case according to Paul, then what are we to make of the countless places in Scripture where there is a distinction made between Jews and Gentiles? I mean, let's not be so naive as to believe that we can erase any and all distinctions between this group of people known as the Israelites, later to be identified as the Jews, and everyone else. It's a distinction that's made continually throughout the Word of God. And furthermore, doesn't all of this talk about the church being true Israel, doesn't that constitute replacement theology? In other words, are we or are we not being taught that the church replaces Israel in God's redemptive plan? The truth of the matter is, this is not what we're being taught at all. To assume that we are advocating for replacement theology is to assume that the Jews, just by being Jews, are redeemed. When you make that faulty assumption, then it's very clear to me at least how people can assume we're replacing Israel with the church. It's like a quid pro quo sort of thing. What used to be Israel is now the church. That's not at all what we're being taught. That's not at all what we believe. As I've said a few times, and as we've been looking at over the last few weeks, what we believe, what we're promoting is not replacement theology, but fulfillment theology. We talked about it just this morning. Whenever we talk about the people of Israel and all of their ceremonies and all of the things that they did as far as even the sacrificial system. We refer to them as being types and shadows of the reality to come. Now that the reality has come in Christ, all of those types, shadows, foreshadowings, bound up in their ceremonies and traditions, in their culture, all of those things have found their fulfillment in Christ himself. And contrary to popular belief, this does not mean that all of those people, as I talked about again this morning, who participated in all of these ceremonies, rites, rituals, observances, traditions, it does not in any way mean that they were all redeemed. Think about it. If all the Jews were redeemed simply on the basis of their identification in the flesh, wouldn't that mean that the scribes and Pharisees would have been given a free pass by Christ? They should have been. If Jews are redeemed just because they're Jews, then does it really matter how they behave or what they do? They should have been given a free pass by Christ. Instead, though, what does Christ do with them? He pronounces woe after woe after woe on them. He tells them that they're whitewashed tombs. That they're like the cups and saucers that are clean on the outside but dirty on the inside. He says that they're no good in their current state of religiosity. He gives them the gospel. Why would he give them the gospel if they were saved just by being Jews? If Jews are automatically saved for being Jews, would Jesus have ever been able to say about Judas, a Jew, by the way, that as the son of perdition it would have been better had he never been born at all? Why would Jesus say that about someone who gets a free pass into heaven? He very well might have said, it's good that he died early because he gets to go to heaven. But no, he was the son of perdition. And Jesus says, it's, it would have been better had he never been born to begin with. Would Paul have needed Jesus' sovereign intervention on the road to Damascus if he were automatically saved for being a Jew? Of course he wouldn't. Why would he later write that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and then to the Greek? Why did the Jews need the gospel? Well, if you ask John Hagee, they don't. Right? I'd love to hear John Hagee's response to these questions. 
you believe that Jews are saved just because they're Jews, they're in covenant relationship with God, then why do they need the gospel? Why did it go to them first, then to the Greek? Why was Peter made an apostle to the Jews if Jews are automatically saved? Or as Steve reminded me on Wednesday, why was there a gospel letter sent to the Hebrews if they're automatically in a saving relationship to God? The point here is the same point that Paul's been making consistently, not just in this letter, but in other places as well. The Jews were simply among the unique and advantaged demographic through whom the one true God chose to make himself known to the world. That's the only way in which they are said to be advantaged or special. They were, in fact, the demographic that God used to reveal himself to the world. And we're grateful for that, are we not? Are you not grateful for the fact that bound up in all of these rituals and ceremonies and things that are in the Old Testament, we can see Christ? Are we not grateful that from the Jews comes the Christ? We are. We should be. Of course, the $64,000 question remains. In their unique status as Jews, what kind of advantage, if any, did they enjoy over non-Jews? Well, this is the question Paul's seeking to answer. Romans 3, starting at verse no, uh, verse 1. Read it with me. Paul asks, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true though every man be found a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come? Their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Now, I realize that this passage can be really confusing. I believe it was John Piper who actually admitted that one of the first times he began studying this passage in earnest, his brain broke a little bit, right? And I, I experienced that very thing when I entered into my own in-depth study of this passage. It's confusing. A lot of what Paul writes can be confusing if we're not careful, and if we don't slow down, as I advocate so often that we do, in order to work out every kink to drag out every nugget of truth that we're able to extract from passages like this. Because once we do that, we'll find that this is a very rich passage indeed. What makes what Paul writes here so confusing is that he seems to be undoing a great deal of what he's just written about there being no distinction, redemptively speaking, between Jews and Gentiles. Again, thus far he has gone to great pains to illustrate the fact that Merely physical Jews are not real Jews, and the elect among the Gentiles are, in fact, the true children of Abraham. Here, though, Paul says that not only do the Jews have an advantage over the Gentiles, but there's also a great benefit in circumcision. What? Is he undoing? Or kind of doing the backstroke a little bit? Kind of relieving himself of some of the things he had said before? Maybe he said them too strongly. Maybe he didn't mean to say what he said. Is it doing that at all? No. Paul would never do that. There's something else going on here. Let's look a little more closely at what that is. First of all, let me establish a very necessary and fundamental presupposition that should govern how we interpret what Paul writes here, and it's this. 
in spite of the fact that there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles from a redemptive standpoint, that does not mean that there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles from a religious, historical, cultural, and ancestral standpoint. This is Paul's argument at the beginning of Romans 9. I told you a minute ago, keep your finger there. Go back there. Verses 1 through 5. Look at what Paul writes. He says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Notice very carefully how Paul qualifies his relationship to the Jews. He refers to them as his brethren and his kinsmen according to the flesh. There's your clue. He's talking about in the flesh. He's admitting, these are not my brothers and sisters in Christ. They're my brethren in the flesh. And oh, by the way, he goes on to say, I have unceasing grief in my heart for them because they're not among the redeemed. I would myself be accursed if it meant that they could be saved. You see the distinction he's setting up. He's saying the very same things that we've been saying all along. There is no salvific value in being related to Abraham in the flesh. Paul wishes there were. Oh, does he wish there, there were a distinction there salvifically, but there's not. And then he acknowledges they are privileged though. Because they've been given this and that and the other thing by God. Now granted, again, always keep it in your mind. The Israelites, who would later become Jews, are simply foreshadows, types of the Christ to come and His people. And they are pictures of God's redemptive plan. But they're still according to the flesh. Unredeemed Jews have a, rela a relationship to Christ, but it's only in the flesh. And don't miss Paul's great expression of sorrow here again. We have to ask ourselves, why would Paul be experiencing such sorrow and grief over his fellow Jews if they were automatically saved? He wouldn't. They need the gospel. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way as in our text this morning, he can't help but acknowledge that even though they were lost and needed Christ, there was still a great temporal advantage to being a Jew. They were the first, he says, to receive the truth concerning the doctrine of adoption. They should have understood that. Remember what Jesus said to those Jews who had been inquiring into the Scriptures? He said, you know, you, you search the Scriptures. What you don't realize is that the very things you were searching, I'm in there. Those things testify about me. You think that you have eternal life just because you've taken these scriptures as God's promises and you've bound them to your forehead and you've wrapped them around your arm. You've put them on the doorpost of your home. You've done all of these physical things. You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. That's those very scriptures that teach about me. You've missed the whole point in the process of insisting that your adherence to the Word of God that saves you and not Christ Himself. You've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Again, you've missed the whole point. The Jews were the first to witness God's glory as human beings firsthand. They participated in God's provision of the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises. They were those who were descended from their fathers, Abraham, <clears throat> Isaac, and Jacob. 
They were those from whom Christ himself would ultimately be born into the world. And this is really similar to what Paul writes in our text this morning when he says that the Jews did, in fact, enjoy certain advantages. Not only did they benefit from circumcision, in that it was the physical representation of God's covenant, but they were also entrusted, he says, with the oracles of God, and they were the first to receive the gospel, as he says in Romans 1. Now again, none of this guaranteed their salvation, but it is beneficial, is it not? It does put them at an advantage over the people who did not have those things. Now let's put this in a practical perspective. It makes much more sense if we look at it from our own perspective as Christians. Can we not affirm that those children whose parents raised them in the fear and admonition of the Lord who read and teach the Word of God to them, bring them to church, model for them what it means to be a genuine believer, can we not agree that those children are at an advantage over children who are not brought to church, whose parents are not believers? Yes, they're advantaged in a manner of speaking. Now, here's the question. Does this advantage automatically equate to salvation? Does the fact that you bring your children to church, the fact that you read the Word of God to them, the fact that you pray with them, the fact that you model Christ for them, is that a guarantee that they will grow up to be believers? No. It's not. And if you're currently living under that delusion, you need to stop. God will have mercy on whom He has mercy. God casts His eternal love on the objects of His love, not on everyone. And he does so based on his grace alone. Based on his sovereign good pleasure alone, not in anything that you and I might do to facilitate that grace. You see, again, this is the big problem that we have between formal religion or mere religiosity and true Christianity. Mere religiosity says... There's a list of certain things that we go through this list and we, in a very perfunctory way, we check off all the boxes. I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. And God is duty-bound to save my children. That's not Scripture. That's religiosity. The Scriptures say that if God is predisposed in His eternal sovereign plan to save whomever He'll save... He will do that. This is Paul's point in verse 3 of our text. What then? If some, that is among this advantaged people, if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? You understand what Paul's saying there? He's driving home the point that just because one is named among the Jews, despite the many advantages they had in all the ways that he cites here and in Romans 9, there's no guarantee that they will be among God's redeemed. Again, Paul's striking at the very heart of the Jews' erroneous belief that God was, in fact, duty-bound to save them just because they're Jews. And, he says, don't get the idea that this somehow renders God unfaithful. The fact that some of the Jews were lost and some were saved, again, goes to God's sovereignty in such matters. And here's the thing, it doesn't go to how good of a Jew they were or how bad of a Jew they were. It doesn't matter. They were foreshadows. They were types. They were simply those through whom God worked to reveal himself, some of whom were lost and would remain so until the day of their death. This is why in verse 4, Paul answers this question about God's faithfulness, perhaps being nullified by the Jews' unbelief. He says, meganoita. What is that? It's the strongest adversative that can be used in the Greek language. We would say in our vernacular today, you must be out your mind if you believe that this points to any unfaithfulness in God. Meganoita, God forbid that you would even think that he's able 
to be unfaithful. It's one of those things that we shouldn't even allow into our minds. It's simply not possible. Paul says, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. In short, Paul wants his readers to understand once again that salvation is not bestowed on us simply because we happen to have certain temporal advantages over others. As beneficial as those advantages may be, salvation is not bestowed on us because of any external factors. Salvation is bestowed on those to whom God is pleased to grant it on the basis of God-given faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, as revealed in the Scriptures alone, to His glory alone. And there's nothing in this entire temporal realm, advantage or no advantage, which is capable of nullifying God's faithfulness. Now, how do we know this to be true? Well, Paul says we know this to be true because God never lies. God never lies. And let this be very instructive to those of you who sometimes waffle in terms of your assurance. Anybody here ever battle with your assurance? You go through these phases where one day you're feeling, you know, on top of the on top of your game and and you insist, "Oh, Praise God, He has redeemed me and I'm saved for all eternity. Then you do something stupid and you slip up and you're like, oh, I guess I forfeited my salvation. Folks, stop doing that. Do you realize that every time you claim to have forfeited your salvation, you're calling God a liar? Every time you insist that you're able to do something, that the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 that you're not able to do, every time you insist that you are able to do it, you're calling God a liar. What does God say at the beginning of Romans 8 through the Apostle Paul? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Period. Some of you might have the older version that extrapolates another portion of the text to those who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. That's not there in the best manuscripts. It's true, practically speaking, but there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And oh, by the way, look how he finishes the chapter. There's nothing in the entire created realm that's able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when he says there's nothing in the entire created realm that's able to separate you from the love of Christ, that includes you. You can't do that. As much as you feel like you have at times, and that's a good thing, by the way, bemoan your sin. Let your sin have its effect on you in terms of forcing you, compelling you to repent of that sin. Recognize sin for what it is, which is an affront to a thrice holy God which provides a temporary withholding of his assurance. It doesn't mean you forfeited your salvation. He will, however, withhold the assurance of your salvation for a time until you deal with the sin that has caused that separation. But you can't undo it. I can't undo it. Why? Because God does not lie. Even though man is sometimes foolish enough to stand in judgment of what God has said, God always prevails. I mean, just do this study sometime. Go to the New Testament and look how many times Jesus himself says, is it not written? What's his meaning there? Has it not been said? What's he saying there? He's saying God said it, believe it. God himself said, I'm not a man that I should lie. Believe it. God will be faithful to carry out his word. Now Paul goes on to write in verse 5, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? 
The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. You know, I couldn't help but chuckle as I read this. Paul says, I'm speaking in human terms, and I'm thinking, well, I must not be human. Because I don't really understand what that means. Until it dawned on me, he's using the same approach here that he uses over in Romans 9 again. He's imagining this antagonist bringing up these arguments. As a matter of fact, when we get to Romans 6, uh, he'll deal with this illogical conclusion. Well, should we sin the more that God's grace may abound? And he says, again, meganoida, may it never be. God forbid that you would even think that. You can't just sin willy-nilly in hopes that God's grace will continually cover that sin. The same thing's being said here. Let me see if I can give you a better understanding of this by a paraphrase. What Paul's saying is this. Some may argue that our sinfulness serves a noble purpose in that it helps to demonstrate how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then from a simple human perspective for him to punish us? This is just the classic of trying to wriggle out of one sinful condition. Hey, my sin's a good thing, right? Why should God punish me for doing that which magnifies His goodness? I've told you before about burning the yard when I was a young child, right? This is how the mind, the fallen mind, operates. I was playing with matches one day. And I set the yard ablaze. It was windy. Nearly burned the house down. But I rationalized it. Because I'd seen my neighbors down the street. In West Texas, they, they uh, during the uh, later winter months, they, they burn the grass off so that new grass will come in thicker and healthier. And, and so we had a couple of guys down the street, these grown adults, who were burning their yards off with a controlled burn, and they had a water hose. And Well, I nearly burned the house down, so I rationalized. But, Dad, the guys down the street are burning their lawns off. I thought I'd just do you a favor. <laughs> it didn't work. My dad was not fooled for a second, right? But you see how I instinctively tried to wriggle out of that by saying, no, you know, what I did could be perceived as a good thing. This is what the imaginary antagonist is doing here. Well, I mean, if my sin magnifies the goodness of God, why not sin more? And again, this goes to Paul's argument in Romans 9, 19. You know, the argument there, if God's made me a vessel for dishonorable use, if he's made me like this, then why does he still find fault? After all, it's his fault that he made me this way. And how does Paul respond to that? Well, he doesn't really. He just says, who are you to answer back to God? Why have you made me like this? The implication being you have no right to ask that. Paul goes on there to say that he has mercy on whom he has mercy and hardens whom he desires. His answer is the same as here in verse 6. Is God unrighteous in his sovereign decision to save some among the Jews and not all of them? May it never be. Otherwise, he says, how will God judge the world? Now here's the point. If God himself can be manipulated by the arguments of mere mortal men, if God himself views some sins one way and others as being another way, some are inherently sinful, others have this ulterior motive of goodness behind them, if God views sin in that way, then God himself can't be righteous. And if God can't be righteous, if God is not righteous, then he cannot judge the world. I don't want a God who judges based upon my every whim. I don't want a God who judges based upon however he feels on any given day. I want a God who judges in absolute, inviolable, sovereign righteousness. Whatever that means for me. We should all want a God who is righteous and who is thus capable of judging the world. The answer that Paul gives is really that the question itself is without merit because God is just. 
In verses 7 and 8, Paul carries the argument of his imaginary antagonist even further. He says, but if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim to say, let us do evil that, may, that good may come. Their condemnation is just. The same thing's being said. If my lying actually enhances God's truthfulness, in other words, if by comparison my lying makes God look better, then how is that a, not, a bad thing? Why is that not a good thing? You know, we talk about Pharaoh in the first hour. Could Pharaoh have not made this same argument? God even said of Pharaoh, I've raised you up so that my power might be demonstrated in you. Could Pharaoh not have said, then all this evil that I'm doing is really serving good? Because it's magnifying your power. He could have very well used that argument. But to do so would have represented a profound misunderstanding of who God is and how he has sovereignly chosen to work in the realm of mankind. Simply stated, as Paul says at the end of verse 8, the very fact that sinful man would resort to making such silly and blasphemous arguments against God's fairness is a sure indication that his condemnation is just. Paul says you think that way, and your thinking that way just proves that you need to be condemned. You don't understand. You've not been given ears to hear. You don't have the eyes to see. You don't have God-given faith to put this all together and see that sin is a horrible thing. It's an affront to a thrice holy God. Sin is the very thing that separates you from God. And the moment you begin suggesting that it's a good thing simply because God is yet glorified in those sins, you've missed the whole point. Paul says that this was a charge that was often made against them. You know, it's not unlike back when John MacArthur released his book, The Gospel According to Jesus. There are people to this day who are still railing against that book. I think it came out in 1984. But they're still railing against that book. They insist that MacArthur, demanding that true salvation be validated and verified by fruit, they're saying what, Paul, what John MacArthur is actually doing, he's adding works to salvation. That's not true. He's not adding anything to salvation. He's simply saying that where salvation is, there will be fruit of that. There's also an accusation that's commonly made against the once saved, always saved people, including us. Oh, you say once saved, always saved. That means that you can claim to be saved and just go live your life any old way you want to. That's not what we're teaching. To that, we too would say, God forbid. We believe that along with salvation comes the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us and teaches us and compels us to live in perfect obedience to the best of our ability and to the best of what remains of our fallen nature getting in the way all the time. We're being told that we nonetheless pursue holiness at every turn. Don't ever think that just because there's no, no condemnation that you're free to sin. That's alien to the gospel itself. It's alien to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Paul's saying that if you believe along those lines, your condemnation is just. You just don't get it. Now, lest there be any remaining misunderstanding, Paul goes on to ask in verse 9, what then, are we better than they? Folks, I have to admit, I don't know who he's talking about here. Who's we and who's they? Most scholars are divided. Most scholars admit they don't know. What is he saying? Are we Jews better than those Gentiles? Some have said he's saying, are we as Christians better than the Jews whose advantage is only temporal? I mean, it could go either way, couldn't it? It could. Most feel like, given the context, Paul's asking whether the Jews are better than the Christians based upon their religious and cultural advantages. And what's the answer? In either case, the answer is not at all. Why? 
Why? Because we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. There's the answer. When you approach a passage like this, this is where it's helpful to go to the very end and see what his answer is. And this answer applies to everything he just said. It doesn't matter what advantage you have as a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter whether you think yourself superior to this group or this group considers themselves superior to this group. It doesn't matter. Why? Because every one of you is a sinner. Every one of you is under sin. Now, where's this charge of universal guilt already been made? He says, as we have already charged. Well, primarily in Romans 1. Who does Paul describe in Romans 1? Is he describing Jews or Gentiles? Yes. Everybody. Everybody falls under Romans 1 in their natural state. All men outside of Christ are guilty of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, a condition in which God actually gives some over to the lust of their flesh and many to their own destruction. Now in the next 18 verses of this third chapter, Paul's going to explain man's innate sinfulness in greater detail. He's going to paint a really painfully detailed picture of what it means to be outside of Christ. What he says in these next 18 verses, all of it applies to every single human being in his or her natural state. Without Christ, you are what Paul describes here. We're going to cover that, Lord willing, in our next time together. But with the time that remains this morning, I want to kind of lay the foundation for what follows in these verses by warning us all of the universality of sin and again, the deception of mere religiosity. I've touched on it this morning. Certainly last week we talked about this difference between formal religion and genuine Christianity. And I just need to say again that there are many, perhaps even in this church this morning, who, like the religious Jews of Paul's day, are engaged in formal religion and because of what you're here doing. Well, Pastor, I came here this morning. I, I come to church regularly. I, I sit and I listen to what's being said. I sing hymns. I pray when it's time to pray. I fellowship with the people who are here. That must mean something in terms of having salvific favor with God. Is that true? No. No. I've said it before, coming to church regularly does not make you any more a Christian than going into your garage daily makes you a car. What you need is a radical transformation of who you are. What you need is that internal work done by the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit in regeneration you don't need to continue checking boxes. The beauty is, as I said before, once the Holy Spirit does that work in you, once you know that you're numbered among the redeemed, guess what you will do from that point forward? You will not forsake the assembling of the saints together as is the habit of some. But as the day draws nearer for Christ's return, you'll stir one another up to good works. You'll pray. You will sing at the top of your lungs. You will shout hallelujah and amen when something resonates with your newborn soul. You'll fall in love with Christ, never to fall out of love with Him again. The things that once bored you to tears will excite you to the very core of your being. You'll be transformed fundamentally from being dead in trespasses and sins to newness of life in Christ. And all of life will be new. Formal religion can't do that. 
Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And He will. And He has. And pray to God that this morning, He will this morning. In some of you who have just been going through the motions, practicing mere religiosity, my prayer, my fervent prayer, is that right now, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the operation of the Holy Spirit, would grab you by the scruff of your neck and pluck you from the miry clay and place you on the rock that is Christ, never to return to your old self. Formal religion kills. The Lord Jesus Christ saves. So many insist because, well, I'm nice to other people. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. Surely God overlooks my sins and considers me among the righteous because I'm doing these things. It's a lie. in spite of the allegedly good things that we might be able to accomplish under the steam of our own flesh, in spite of our best efforts at proving to ourselves and others that we're not as bad as most by adhering to the various rules and regulations that we've adopted to govern our behavior, if those things are done outside of Christ, they are, as Isaiah said in Isaiah 64, 6, they are filthy rags. Most of you are probably thinking to yourself, yeah, we know all that. We're well aware of what the Scriptures teach about the doctrine of original sin and its consequences. We all know that. And if you do know these things, good. But I would dare say again that there are some here this morning who don't quite understand that. There are some here this morning who still see fallen man condition, man's condition as a sin's issue as opposed to a sin issue. Now, what's the difference? Well, we need to understand that without Christ, in our natural state, we are not condemned because of the sins that we commit. See where I'm going with that? You're not condemned because of the sins you commit you're condemned because outside of Christ, you are in sin. You suffer from a condition known as original sin. Paul talks about this in Romans 5.12. Through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. As Paul said to the Ephesians, Prior to our salvation in Ephesians 2, 3, we were all by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. The preacher's commentary is helpful here. Listen to this. It says there's a major difference between sin and sins. So we must be very careful not to confuse doing things that are not right with the fact that we are dominated by a fundamentally evil dynamic. The difference is not unlike that which exists between the symptoms of a disease and the disease itself. When this is understood, it becomes obvious that the human predicament is not so much that we have done things wrongly, but that we are in the Christless state under the command, under the authority, under the control of sin, and helpless to escape from it. Accordingly, any, any solution to the human problem that fails to deal with the root cause of sin is no more a solution than cold compresses on a fevered brow or a cure for the infection causing the fever. Think about it this way. The Jew is one who benefits from a rich history of religious, cultural, and traditional advantages, all of which were intended to paint Christ in vivid colors and textures for them to be able to see should God grant them that ability. But these so-called advantages were merely temporal. And likewise, many of you come to church as a form of mere religious expression and not out of a, an abiding relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. All you're doing is deceiving yourself by making yourself a type, a picture, a foreshadowing of a reality that you know nothing of. Be careful that you understand that. 
even if you're an extraordinarily good person by the world's standards, even if you're able to live your life relatively free from most egregious sins, remember what God's standard is. What's God's standard? Perfection. If you insist that you're a good person, you better be a perfectly good person. If you insist that you're able to follow the mandates of God's moral law, then you better obey it perfectly. Because the moment you trip up at one thing, what happens? You forfeit it all. And think of it this way. How many times does Christ die for our sins? Once. What would happen if you could forfeit that? Well, the writer of the Hebrews tells us. That passage in Hebrews chapter 10, 23 through 25, if you keep reading, which you should because it's attached, it says, for the one who goes on sinning willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But what? But the fearful expectation of judgment. Thank the Lord that He paid it all. Thank the Lord that even now, whenever we do mess up, our advocate is standing right next to the Father, sitting next to the Father, saying, it's okay. He's mine. He might be ugly. <laughs> he might act ugly. But he's mine. You can't achieve a righteous standard sufficient to please God. But there's one who could and did. And his name is Jesus. As Paul explains in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He, God, made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is why Peter could say with such conviction in Acts 4.12 that there is salvation in no one else. Why? There's no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. The name Steve won't do it. The name Tim won't do it. The name Peggy won't do it. The name John won't do it. There's one name. And it's Jesus. I pray that if there's anyone here this morning still living under the delusion of your own alleged goodness as your ticket to heaven, our collective prayer for you is that you would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Today is the day of salvation. You don't know that you have another day left for you. Today is the day of salvation. Truth be told, your advantages, and hear me well on this, children, your advantages simply because mom and dad bring you here, just because you might sit and pay attention, just because you might do this, that, and the other thing, those are advantages, yes, but those advantages serve only one purpose, and that's to make you more accountable. In a way that we can't possibly understand, you who have come here week in and week out practicing mere religiosity, you're only heaping more and more judgment on yourself. Some of you who partook this morning in the Lord's table, knowing that you're not qualified to partake, knowing that you cannot truly recognize and associate yourself with the finished work of Christ. What does Paul say? Many who partook unworthily, many of them became ill, many of them slept. Doesn't mean they took a nap. It means they died. It's a serious thing. It's an incredibly serious thing. So again, I would encourage you to recognize your hopeless and helpless condition outside of Christ. Turn to Him. Turn to Him. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You, Lord, that in Your sovereignty, in Your omniscience, we thank you that you have, in fact, used this particular group of people to serve as guideposts, if you will, to serve as 
types and shadows and foreshadowings of the ultimate work that would be performed in Christ and in Christ alone. Father, we know that in their mere religiosity, there is no saving value. But the same thing is true of many here this morning who have relied on their ability to do, their ability to check these boxes, as it were, in hopes that you might be impressed enough to save them. Father, I ask even now that you would impress upon every one of us yet again the truth that salvation is by your grace alone, through God-given faith alone, in Christ alone, as taught in your word alone, and to your glory alone. Help us to understand that as advantaged as we might be, as advantaged as those around us might be, there's only one who saves. And his name is Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the instruction you've given us this hour. We pray as we always pray that we would leave this place with a renewed intention to not just be hearers, but doers of your word as well. Might we do that not to impress you, not in hopes that we might gain something. As Paul says, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus already. Help us to do it again as a means of glorifying your name. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.